Today, we're pleased to welcome Lynn Fairbanks of UCLA's Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences, and her title is Developmental Programming and Resilience in Urban Monkeys. <laughs> Hello. Um, those of you who uh, know me um, know that I've been interested in maternal behavior and mother-infant relationships for most of my career. Um, and have spent a lot of the last 25 or 30 years studying vervet monkeys. Um, today I want to uh, give a talk in two parts. The first part is looking at how maternal condition and maternal diet during gestation and lactation influence the quality of maternal care, and, um, and then uh, how infants respond to variation in the care that mothers give. And then in part two, which is much more speculative, I want to look at does this make any difference for the longer term development of the offspring. So I'm looking at yearling behavior and seeing um, if, if differences that we noticed in the first few months of life carry forward into the juvenile period. Um, this uh, talk is based on a chapter I want to I want to tell you about this book, Building Babies, Primate Development and Proximate and Ultimate Perspective. Our own Katie Hind uh, with Catherine Clancy and Julianne Rutherford put this book together. And it, um, it's just chock full of great chapters. And it, it, I think it corrects um, a, a missing aspect of anthropology, which is not really paying enough attention to development and early development in, um, within anthropology. And this book does a terrific job, so I, I highly recommend it. Um, the, from evolutionary biology, we know that female primates need extra energy for reproduction, um, including gestation, um, lactation, and infant carrying. And we also know from basic evolutionary biology that there are life history trade-offs that females must make between their own growth, uh, their own body maintenance, and effort that they can put into reproduction. Um, two very important um, papers that influenced me a lot in, when I was in graduate school um, really framed a lot of work that was going, or a lot of ideas that were in the field um, and by Robert Tr Trivers in 1972 when he discussed parental investment theory where he very specifically talked about investment being a, a, a lifetime function um, such that effort invested in one offspring came at a cost to the opportunity to have other offspring. So it really helped to establish a kind of a slightly different idea in the field about the sort of trade-offs that mothers make when they, uh, particularly mammalian mothers who have such a large um, physical investment in reproduction. Um, and then uh, a few years later by his parent offspring conflict paper where in recognizing that a mother is equally related to all of the offspring that she is going to produce in her lifetime, but any individual offspring is more closely related to itself than it is to its brothers and sisters, um, that uh, the optimal amount of care for an infant to receive will, by definition, be greater than the optimal amount of care for the mother to give, setting up an inherent conflict over the, the timing and the amount of care um, that a mother is donating and an infant is trying to extract. Um, the data that I'm going to talk about comes from the um, Vervet Colony, Vervet Research Colony, when it was at UCLA. This colony was founded in 1975 with uh, vervets brought from the Caribbean, 57 founders over the first five years. Um, the species name has been changed from Circopithecus to uh, Chlorocebus, and the genus, the, or the genus name, the specific name from Sabius to Aethiops. Um, so <laughs> but it's the same monkey. Um, <laughs> we started off in 75 with 14 animals, um, you know, brought in more over the years. And 
those animals had babies and those animals had babies. And the population um, during the time, uh, toward the end of the time it was at UCLA, um, reached 450 animals approximately, at which time we started to manage further population growth. But we had um, up to eight generations of vervets. Um, the, uh, we kept these, uh, particularly the original four groups, were always maintained in stable, multi-generational social groups, where females remain in their natal group for life, and males uh, transferred out at puberty to mimic the, the natural process of male emigration and immigration. Um, in the um, vervet system, infant, in, females um, have an infant once a year under very favorable conditions. Um, infants dependent on the mother for food um, exclusively during the first four months of life. The, we did have an uh, older female die and when her infant was four months old and it was able to survive on the chow provision diet from that point on. That's why I say first four to six months of life with a declining rate of time on the mother and time nursing over the first six months of life. It's a five and a half month gestation period. So at six months, the mother's starting to cycle again and um, getting ready to breed again. Um, now in the primate literature, um, was noticed both in the field and in captive studies, a lot of natural variation in um, maternal condition for reproduction. It was noted in, the f in field studies and in captive studies that females who are very young, uh, very old, had higher infant mortality and um, lower fertility. Um, a mother's weight um, is related to f fertility and infant mortality. Um, with low weight being a risk factor. Um, a number of studies found a relationship between dominance rank and reproductive performance, um, particularly high-ranking females who are able to control access to resources and control the behavior of other group members um, more effectively, um, tend to have shorter interbirth intervals than lower-ranking females. And then um, Food availability, provisioning increases fertility, shortens interbirth interval, um, drought um, uh, in the field conditions um, increases interbirth interval. So all these factors are known um, and logically influence female reproduction. Now, um, Phyllis Lee in 1991 did a very interesting paper. She was reviewing a lot of mammalian studies of maternal condition and weaning age. And she found in some of the studies when maternal condition was better that, um, that the, uh, there was a shorter interbirth um, interval. But then other times she found when conditions got worse, there was a shorter, you know, a, a quicker weaning age. Um, Part of this, um, she explained by um, a hypothesis that weaning age is a U-shaped function of resource availability and maternal condition. Now, part of this is because females tend to be seasonal. Births in primates tend to be seasonal. So if you can't quite make, uh, if you can't quite get this infant weaned within your six-month window, then um, you, you, you can't just extend it a few more months. You basically have a break point. Um, so then if you can't reproduce the next year, then you're going to have later weaning and a longer weaning period. Um, but if females in the worst condition um, terminate investment early, often resulting in mortality of the infant. So in the worst circumstances, the female just cannot afford to continue the pregnancy without jeopardizing her own future reproduction, and so she has early weaning. Females in the best condition also have earlier weaning because they can get the kid off and get ready to reproduce the next year. Um, and they do not suffer higher mortality in and under those circumstances, and under intermediate circumstances, either for female condition or um, environmental conditions, um, you see slightly later we weaning, also similar mortality and longer interbirth intervals. Um, now, these um, 
she postulated the U-shaped function, but there was no one study that actually had uh, had the three groups to demonstrate that it truly was a U-shaped function um, until uh, we um, divided the groups based on those criteria of uh, breeding females into three groups. Um, defined, uh, we defined the group as marginal for reproduction, very young females, three-year-old uh, Females, I call teenage mothers, um, are have a lower fertility rate, but in the captive circumstances of free monkey chow, um, some many of the three-year-olds do breed. They are still growing. They haven't reached their full body weight. They haven't reached their full length. They uh, don't get their full dentition, their third molars, until um, between four and five years of age. So they are still growing. Um, so the three-year-old females. Um, older females who were in a situation where they were starting to develop medical problems of age and having reduced fertility, and then um, females that were underweight, which was used, most of them were also in the very young um, situation, but a few of them were also older or um, undergoing some um, medical condition. So, um, so that group we put together for the marginal mothers. We had had data from the development of the colony to, to demonstrate that those groups also had um, lower fertility and um, higher mortality rates. Um, in the prime group, we put high-ranking females of prime reproductive age, which we defined as between 5 and 14. And then we put all the others, which was more than half of the colony, um, into um, the average group. Um, for that original study that we published in 1995, we had 160 mother-infant dyads that were from my original, four original groups, um, collected over time between 1980 and 1990. Each infant was observed um, equally, uh, equal number of samples for each week of life from birth through six months of age. And we measured the standard primate mother-infant behaviors, um, maternal behavior, um, the protective behaviors where mother approaches an infant, which means she goes from beyond a meter to within a meter. She initiates ventral contact, or she restrains the infant, not letting it leave. The um, rejecting behaviors, she um, either will not allow the infant to gain nipple access, or she pushes it off, or she threatens the infant. Um, Breaking ventral contact is just that she's the one who initiates the leaving of ventral contact, and leaving is moving from within a meter to beyond a meter. And we also measured the percent time mothers and infants were in any kind of body contact and in ventral contact. Um, for the infant behavior, um, we measured the infants approaching and leaving the mother and making and breaking ventral contact. Um, now, looking at the, in the original study, looking at these three groups, um, we found um, in the first month of life, many of the marginal mothers allowed the infants to be out of contact with themselves a higher percentage of time than the average and primate, prime mother groups. Um, these infants are often being carried by caretakers in the group. Um, the, uh, several of the Marginal mothers didn't do much to try to get their infants back, and they had higher early infant mortality than the females in the other two groups. Um, when we look at this um, mother-infant relationships with surviving infants for the three groups, um, this is a month of life, and this is the frequency per hour of that rejection behavior. Um, you can see these are, these are the average mothers. And, and on typically, rejection's very low in the early months of life, and then peaks at about four months when the females are starting to begin cycling again and uh, maintains at a moderate level from months four to six. Um, Already at month two, both the marginal mothers and the prime mothers 
are having higher rates of rejection than the, than the average mothers, um, peaking at the third month of life. Um, so it's an earlier peak and uh, a much earlier time period. This is month two and three of life, is a time when the infants are getting off the mother, starting to come and go on their own. The mother is a you know, safe anchor um, time, but they are also totally dependent on the mother for um, nutrition. And unlike Susan Scapuchins, there's not much um, co-nursing in vervet. So if the infant's off the mother, it's not getting, um, it's not getting fed by anyone else. So taking, taking this data, which is broken down by a month, and just doing a monthly average, you can see here that the marginal mothers are the highest, the average mothers are the lowest, and the prime mothers are also up in the same range as the marginal mothers. So we do have a U-shaped function of uh, an ordinal increase in maternal condition um, by maternal rejection. Um, these, I had to grab the, these are, these were originally slides, you know, remember slides, <laughs> and I don't know where they are. <laughs> so I did a bad job of copying these off of the publication. Um, this is the, uh, the contact index developed by Robert Hind of the infant's role in maintaining ventral contact with the mother. It's infant making contact minus infant breaking contact is a, um, uh, percentage of total contacts and uh, minus the mother's role. And you can see that a high number means the infant is contributing more toward maintaining contact. A low number is the uh, infant's contributing less. So you can see that the infant's role reflects the rejection data. The more the mother rejects, rather than just laying there and taking it and saying, OK, um, the infant's fighting back. And so the infant's trying harder to achieve ventral contact um, in both the marginal group and the prime group compared to the average mothers. Um, in this original study, it didn't, they didn't succeed all the way. They succeeded part way by their efforts, but we still have significantly more ventral contact time on average over the first six months of life in the average group than we do in the marginal and prime group. Um, this is an interesting slide because females who, it was known at that time that females who lose an infant with data from field and captivity will have a shorter interbirth interval to the birth of their next infant. But if you, interesting relationship between maternal condition and the effects of infant survivorship. Um, if you look at the surviving infants, the marginal mothers and the average mothers both have a longer inter, and equal interbirth interval. Uh, prime mothers are able to translate that increased rejection and reduced contact time into shorter interbirth intervals. Um, if you look at the at the infants that died, um, both the average mothers and the prime mothers can shorten their interbirth interval um, even shorter if they're not caring for the previous infant. These marginal mothers, um, many of whom were, you know, who were either all either very young or old, um, just couldn't make up the difference. They just the the process of going through gestation and even the that early infant um, care in the first month of life, um, they, they, they still needed the recovery time. So they did not derive the interbirth interval benefit from, uh, from the, losing the infant. Um, but they did, were able to repair their own bodies, continue growing. Um, it's interesting for the three-year-old females, many of them reverted to play groups and you know, just almost completed their adolescent behavioral development and then uh, we're able to reproduce um, the next year. OK, so to review that study, um, maternal, it, we did validate the idea um, and Lee's hypothesis that maternal condition is a U-shaped function of maternal, um, con, maternal care is a U-shaped function of maternal condition. Mothers in the worst condition and the best condition for reproduction, limited current investment compared to mothers in average condition. 
Marginal mothers had to limit investment to preserve their own health and future reproductive success, even at the cost of infant loss. And prime mothers could limit investment to shorten the interbirth interval without increasing risk for their current infant. So this also provides support for parent-offspring conflict theory. The infants responded to reduced care by increasing effort to regain ventral contact. And indicating infants have evolved strategies to deal with variation in maternal care within the expectable range of variation. And in access to food, no, no. Age and weight, but um, the weight was usually age-related or health-related, not, um, not having to do with access to food at all. There was, there was no uh, domination of the food. Um, this, this last point here is very important. This is, this is a difference within the expectable range of variation, that um, it is primate infant being born could be born to a young mother, an old mother, um, a mother in a good year or a bad year. This is, this is all through the history of selection for infant behavior. This, it, this degree of variation is something that is an acceptable variation in the, in the environment. And so the infants seem to have adapted to, to respond to this range of variation. Um, that um, partially for, to have a data set for part two, I tried to see if I could replicate this study. The original data was from 1980 to 1990. Um, in 2000, I took over the, I took responsibility for the whole colony, which is now 16 groups. The additional groups were, some of them were fission products of the old groups. Some of them hadn't been stable for as long as the original groups. But they were all stable for at least several years. And they had, you know, matrilines in them. Um, we, uh, I reduced the amount of observation time in order to be able to collect data on all mothers in the 16 groups. We cut it down to only observing during month two and three. If you'll remember, I mean, actually, I picked it because I was interested in maternal protectiveness, and that also shows its biggest variation in month two and three. But as you saw from the earlier slide, month two and three was also a time when maternal condition made a big difference in rejection. So uh, same criteria, same age criteria, weight criteria, and rank criteria to form the three groups. And in this uh, uh, four-year period, including 2000 through 2003, we had 44 marginal mothers, 116 average mothers, and 44 prime mothers. Now, we were not looking at interbirth interval because at this point we were managing reproduction to, to stop the colony from exponential rate of growth by um, rotating vasectomized males. So we're not really concerned with interbirth interval, but we are looking at maternal behavior. and. Amazingly, I mean, do you know how few replication studies there are in primate behavior? It's, it's sad because it's so much work, it's so difficult, and it's, it's not like the psychology mouse people where everybody starts off by replicating. I, this, I'm very proud of the fact that this, this study replicated almost identically um, and that the marginal mothers and the prime mothers had higher maternal rejection of infant uh, um, access um, rates compared to average mothers. And um, the, the way I verified the U-shaped function was looking for the quadratic component in, a, in a, an analysis of variance. So it's, you, you can look, you can do a polynomial assessment, and usually you're just looking for group differences. A, a linear assessment will look to see if it goes up or down, and the quadratic component tells you if it's a significant quadratic component tells you there's a significant bend in the relationship. So that's what I did for these, and this was a significant quadratic component. Um, the fact that this is not just you know all easy and fun and games for the infants, um, we can see infant distress cry also reflects the level of maternal rejection. These are infants complaining about the way they're being treated. 
And then um, also the infant's role in contact. In this case, the marginal group is even a little bit higher, but that is also a significant quadratic relationship with the marginal, the infants of marginal mothers and prime mothers um, taking a larger part in regaining ventral contact. So this replicated the original behavioral results that maternal rejection is a U-shaped function of maternal condition. It showed evidence that this situation does rise to the level of just some distress for the infants, but then the, in, the infants responded adaptively, serving their own needs um, to increase contact time. And in, this, in the replication, um, the, the difference in contact time between the three groups was not significant. So they, they did a better job in the replication study of overcoming um, the maternal rejection. Okay, another way to look at maternal condition is through um, diet. Um, I, for since the beginning of the colony through 2003, the monkeys got as much monkey chow as they wanted and were also supplemented with fruits and vegetables. And they, you know, over the years and uh, over the uh, as females age and the colony wide over the years, they tended to put on more weight. And so they were, uh, we were getting a number of females who were overweight by field standards um, and uh, continued, you can see that's, you know, the, a, a field weight is more like four kilos and we had one female <laughs> obese. Um, we were also developing some problems even with gestational diabetes because of this. So we decided to try different diet alternatives that might have a more natural level of fiber. I mean, initially I gave them just a whole lot more fibrous vegetables and they ate those and they ate the monkey chow too, so that didn't work. But so we switched the chow to a higher fiber diet called the fiber balanced chow. Um, it, um, it had almost three times as much fiber um, and less metabolizable energy per gram um, and uh, somewhat more protein and somewhat uh, lower carbohydrate content than the old diet. Um, we gradually um, introduced this in the summer of 2004 and um, that they, again, they had as much as they wanted to eat, but they didn't like it as much. And uh, this is adult females' um, weight by year. Now we measured them um, uh, at the beginning of the year, and you can see weight was fairly constant in the chow years, and there was a big drop in weight um, uh, after the introduction of the new chow, which was maintained through 2006, and I don't know, maybe a slight increase in 2007, but, but the, the three um, high fiber years are uh, females spontaneously lost weight because they were eating less. Um, it was a healthy weight loss. They weren't, nobody was getting skinny. It was proportionally more for the fatter females. And there were also significant reductions in cholesterol and triglycerides that accompanied it. So this was a healthy weight loss back toward a, a value of weight that's closer to uh, females in the wild. Well, so I decided to look and see what does this do to maternal behavior and mother-infant relationships. And in the diet sample, we looked at before <laughs> the diet change, during that transitional year, and after the diet change um, for uh, 279 infants that were born, about equally divided between males and females. Um, the, we had um, 2001 through 2003 <clears throat> births on the standard diet. The 2004 births, because most of the births uh, peak in July and August, and we were gradually introducing the new diet over three months starting in June. Um, we, um, the transitional year, the 2004, had a normal gestation on the old high chow, you know, the, the old chow diet, and they had um, most of lactation on the new diet. And then um, for years 2005 and 2006, 
both gestation and lactation were on the high fiber diet. And by the time the females conceived in 2005, they had already lost that weight in that weight de decline. Um, you can see the mother's weight here. The transitional group is not is slightly but not significantly lower than the standard group, but the high fiber group is significantly lower. They lost a, almost 10 percent of body weight. Um, uh, as with the other study, which I didn't even point out, there's no significant effect on uh, maternal protectiveness, which is a factor which includes mother restraining, mother making contact, and mother approaching. Um, there is a significant difference in maternal rejection. The females on the high fiber diet for both gestation and lactation scored significantly higher on the rejection factor. This includes both a significant individual score for the, the individual rejection behavior and also for the mother leaves um, uh, within this difference. Um, oh, this. Um, yeah, the, this shows the, indiv <coughs> excuse me, the individual behaviors. Um, for some reason, this graph doesn't have the transitional group under rejection. The transitional group rejection was pretty close to the standard. Um, leaves was halfway between. But. Um, infants role in contact. The, as the infants role in contact had already increased in the transitional group, and was the highest in the high fiber group. So the infants are compensating for um, the, by increasing their attempts uh, to get in contact with the mother. Um, there was also a slight but no, not significant reduction in ventral contact time on the high fiber diet. Um, if I look at this within mother, um, because <laughs> A number of mothers were, <coughs> excuse me, observed on the standard diet and the high fiber diet. You see it holds true within mothers. 80% um, uh, of the mothers increased their rejection on the high fiber diet compared to the standard diet. And it was also significantly related to mother's weight. The lower the mother's weight, the more rejecting she was. So the high fiber diet produced natural weight loss for mothers. Weight loss led mothers to preserve energy and limit investment in the current infant. Mothers were more rejecting. And the infants compensated by increasing efforts to maintain contact and nipple access. So again, very much the same story. Mothers are adjusting the access to the nipple according to their condition, and infants are trying to counteract that. So now for, for part two, I want to explore what the long-term effects of this difference in early um, experience may be. Um, the, um, the replication sample um, for maternal condition um, produced a, a sample that were observed as yearlings in the home group and also the novelty challenge test. This was prefer preferable to looking at the diet sample because the diet sample was confounded by year cohort potential effects. Whereas for the maternal condition sample, each year had m mothers from all three groups. And mothers change from one group to another. And um, every social group also has females from all three conditions. So we don't have to, we don't have a, a source of bias in the data. So that's why I use the maternal condition sample um, to look for long-term effects. Now, turns out there's a lot of different theories out there of what these effects might be. The sort of traditional um, monkey psychological point of view uh, doesn't have a name, but I call it the deficit deficit hypothesis. And so any adverse early experience impairs development. Um, 
a lot of the early research in primate development involved taking infants completely away from their mother or doing repeated separations from the mother where not just for a few minutes, you know, like for, for hours and days. And these, um, th that kind of experience um, causes lots of problems for the kid, which persist. Um, emotional dysregulation, decreased social competence, usually increased aggressiveness, increased stress reactivity. Oops, just a sec, let me get this out of here. Um, at, at, those studies are based on experiences, many of them that are outside of the expectable range of, of experience and outside the range that we could expect an infant to be adapted to respond to. Um, developmental programming, which is a big theme, and part of my title, a big theme here in Building Babies, um, originated with, um, it, well, it was reviewed by um, Barker and uh, Langley Evans, who noted that, uh, I think originally it was a Dutch famine, um, uh, found that infants with low uh, food restriction for the mother produced um, changes in uh, birth weight, changes in growth rates for the fetus, which um, the idea was is that the if, if fetal growth is sensitive to the gestational environment and is adjusting to uh, its growth rate to the nutrition that's available in order for the fetus to be able to survive. Um, then after the infant's born, um, uh, particularly if there's now access to a lot more food, there, the pre-adaptation for uh, a lean environment leads to increased long-term risk for chronic disease, a cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. Um, this developmental programming model has also been used with stress reactivity. Um, mothers who are um, experience a lot of stress during pregnancy, the stress hormones um, are influential in s setting the stress response system of the infant. And so there are people that say being stressed as an infant increases stress reactivity. Um, for offspring, which persists for life because it's happening during crucial periods of, of development that, um, that uh, the, and the infer it, it's considered to be an adaptive theory because the infant's modifying development according, adaptively according to the circumstances that it finds itself in. Now, Early on, way back when I was a graduate student, I learned about developmental canalization. Remember the sort of like the bowling ball rolling down the, the landscape that um, uh, Waddington noticed that in spite of growing up in lots of different environments, many animal individuals seem to kind of turn out um, according, according to a species typical trajectory. So development is canalized and it, it there are adaptive mechanisms to overcome disadvantages that you run into in expectable disadvantages in the environment. And one um, good example of that is catch-up growth. And it's why it's so hard for people to lose weight. Because when you do lose weight and uh, then your body has altered its metabolism to try to quick get you back up to where you were before. Um, so there are there are correction mechanisms. Um, so developmental canalization says that uh, development is designed to self-correct and to be buffered against environmental influences. Um, resilience is a common term that um, we all use, but as, as really explained and defined by Michael Rudder, um, it, he's looking at uh, why do human children um, who ha experience adverse environments, many of them have problems, but some of them don't. And so he's looking for what are the factors that help to protect against adverse early experience. And he noted that um, having an, uh, a caring or competent adult in, if you have bad parents, then having a teacher who takes care of you, having a substitute figures, um, 
And then also he noted individual attributes, personality factors, or uh, some people look at genetic risk factors that increase or decrease um, uh, vulnerability to early adversity. Um, so there are some individuals and some will have resilience factors that help them overcome and recover from early adversity, while others will not. And then finally, the uh, stress inoculation model, um, uh, which uh, David Lyons and Karen Parker have been um, writing a lot about, um, it says almost just the opposite. It, this is the what doesn't kill you will make you stronger hypothesis, which was nominated for a Grammy this year. <laughs> um, the uh, exposure to mild early life stressors actually enhance your ability to handle future stressors. <coughs> this is a, another case of a U-shaped function. No stress in life is worse than some stress, but severe stress is, is bad also. So it's, it's kind of like just the right amount of mo moderate expectable stress um, helps to develop the system and helps the system to be more adaptive compared to, to very little stress. Um, and uh, it's better than uh, serious stress, which also impairs development. OK, so we also watch all the yearlings. Um, we do these uh, what we call home group scans um, that measure the um, number of one-minute intervals that are involved in physical activity, locomotion, running, jumping, climbing, um, involvement in social play. Um, uh, social approach, again, moving beyond a meter to within a meter and sitting down next to another animal so that there's a, uh, you know, an actual, they're not just running by. Um, and time near others are, we're measuring as indicators of social motivation, social competence, physical activity. And then we also um, have a novelty test, a home group. It's in the home group. But, um, in these years, we present um, the, the group with a, a novel object. In these cases, it was a predator-like object in a basket outside the cage. And we measure who runs over, what their latency to run over is, and how much time they spend near this novel and potentially threatening or risky thing. Um, um, so, uh, you know, Katie Hind was my co-author on this chapter, and she said I should make a table trying to figure out what my predictions are from each of these theories. So um, you can tell me how much you agree or disagree with these <laughs> predictions. The deficit hypothesis from having a – the marginal mothers, remember, had a – or the, the – juveniles born to marginal mothers had a, a difficult or somewhat less ideal gestational environment as well as a more rejecting mother and possibly deficits in lactation. We uh, did not measure that, unfortunately. Um, the um, prime mothers um, presumably had normal gestation, um, but they had uh, they experienced maternal higher rates of maternal rejection um, during lactation, <coughs> and they are also growing up high ranking, which is so puts them in a, a socially advantageous position. Um, so we're so what do we predict for these two groups? The the deficit group. Um, would, for the marginal mothers, just be possibly less active, um, less socially competent, and more inhibited about novelty, see, more stressed in the novelty situation and less likely to approach. For the prime mothers, uh, their gestation was perfectly normal. I don't expect differences in activity level. Um, maybe, you know, just I wasn't really sure what to predict there. They had a rejecting mother. It might impair play. It might impair novelty seeking. Um, developmental programming is also looking at that gestational environment. And there again, we would predict 
less activity, less play, um, less social approach, and less novelty seeking because those infants would have been adapted to a more difficult environment. Um, and they would have had a slower growth rate. They would have had a lower expectation for benefits from the environment, we're presuming. And I would expect that, based on developmental programming, that there would be few or no differences for the prime mothers, um, who presumably had perfectly good quality milk. They were just controlling access to it. The canalization model would predict, I think, that they would just get over it, that the, everything would just kind of, it wasn't, they, they didn't, they weren't put in an isolation box for a year. They just had variation within the normal range of variation in gestational and lactational experience. So they should have gotten over it and we, we should find no differences. The resilience model would predict no differences for the prime mothers because for the offspring of the prime mothers, because they had all the benefits of growing up high ranking and not as much deficit. Um, for, the, for the offspring of the marginal mothers, now they've got these kind of slightly less competent, older, very young mothers, um, and, and you know the, this less than optimal early gestation and lactational experience. So, so I predicted that they would be less active, less play, and less social approach, less time near. Um, I guess I should have put maybe less novelty seeking in there too. Um, now the, the one that's really different besides the canalization one is the stress inoculation model. Because that would predict, if we considered that what happened to these infants to be mild stressors with of the type that they should be adapted to deal with. And we saw that, in fact, that they did deal adaptively with it in terms of their increased approach behavior. That if anything, they would do, they might even do better. They might be more, more active, play more, to have more social approach and more novelty seeking than average, than offspring of average mothers. Um, and this for both uh, the marginal and the prime. So anybody want to dispute? Yes? I'm just wondering where risk taking comes in. Risk taking? Yeah. Um, Under, like human life history, the idea being that if, if a partner feels like there's a lot of uh, risk or, or yeah, it must, there might be more risk taking given a birth environment. Um, yeah, I, I, I understand what you mean because um, if you you know if you've got a high expectation of of dying, you you better do it now or you're not going to have a chance to later. Um, that is a point. Now, one of the th findings that we did have working with Mark Loudenslager with uh, cortisol from hair, which gives a long-term cortisol measure, we did notice that um, that novelty seeking. Um, for adult females um, is inversely related to cortisol. So those who are, are, have slightly more stress hormone on board are slower to go over, less likely to just jump over and be the first one to look at the tarantula or the snake. Um, so, um, so that would indicate that, um, that being, you know, being more a slightly more anxious type, if I could make that inference, um, would make you less novelty seeking. Um, but um, yeah, no, you you could you could say that you could. That's why this is such an interesting exercise. You know, what do you predict? Um, the idea that if you haven't got much to lose, you may as well go for it. So, which group would we put that one in? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, we'll we'll see what the results tell us. Um, okay. So we had 147 yearlings born in that um, uh, maternal condition 
pre-diet change sample, um, 2000 through 2003. Um, uh, I split them into males and females because it turns out that sex differences emerge strongly um, for yearlings. Um, very little um, noticeable for infants, but big differences for yearlings. The boys do more rough and tumble play, the girls do more social approach and network building that way. So I looked at them separately. Um, I, this is a result I don't exactly understand, but um, that for, for the males, actually there's pretty good support for canalization. Um, no significant differences in physical activity based on maternal condition or social approach or time near others. There was a significant linear effect of maternal condition on social play. So the marginal group did played more than the prime group. I don't know why the prime group played less. These are these are the privileged sons of the high-ranking females. <laughs> so I'm not exactly sure. Um, I don't really have a prediction for that. Um, uh, but uh, but it is interesting that rather than being impaired in this important developmental social activity, the offspring of the marginal mothers were actually sig played significantly more, the male offspring. Um, for the females, there was also no difference in activity, no difference in social play, but there were significant effects on social approach and time near, and in the direction of the marginal and prime um, offspring um, doing more to approach others and having that result in more time spent near others. So these infants who took a more active part in maintaining relationships with their mother when they were infants are continuing to do that as yearlings. Now these are approaches not just to their mothers, these are approaches to anybody, but you know, at a time when yearlings are building social networks. So rather than any of the deficit hypotheses this appears to be more consistent with the stress inoculation hypothesis. Now, the novelty seeking test produced the, the only real deficit. Males and females are together here because, interestingly, there's no difference in, um, in scored novelty seeking um, uh, between males and females in the colony. Um, but there was definitely a significant effect of maternal condition on novelty seeking. And in this case, the yearling offspring of the marginal mothers had much lower scores than, um, than uh, the other two groups, which did not differ from one another. So the yearlings of marginal mothers played more and took a more active part in maintaining social relationships compared to yearlings of average mothers which was consistent with stress inoculation hypothesis, but under more challenging conditions. Now, it's, it's long been known in you know, primate development studies that you may not see differences in a neutral or familiar home group setting, but when you put animals in a challenge test is where deficits will show up. And we could consider <clears throat> that to be the case here, even though this is not the most challenging. The most challenging test is taking them out of the home group and putting them in a novel situation themselves. This gave them the freedom to just sit back and do nothing or to run over, and they weren't put in the, put in the box. Um, but, <clears throat> but we could, <clears throat> if we assume that this is a more challenging condition, then the yearlings of marginal mothers were more inhibited uh, or we could say they're more fearful, or we could say they're less interested, or they, in fact, they were slower to go over and explore and spent less time near the novel object. So this, would, this is what we predicted from developmental programming and uh, deficit hypothesis. Um, and from the resilience hypothesis, assuming they didn't have the resilience features, um, for the prime mothers, um, they took a more active part in maintaining social relationships compared to yearlings of average mothers, which is also consistent with stress inoculation. 
Um, and there were no effects of maternal condition on activity level, which consistent with canalization and resilience hypotheses. Um, yeah? Oh, no? <laughs> um, so I, I consider those very preliminary results. It was an interesting exercise, um, especially to really think through what we predict rather than just going through the data, seeing what's there, and then coming up with a, your favorite rationalization um, after the fact. It, it was an interesting exercise, and, and I actually recommend considering alternate theories. I, I think in, in science, and I, I don't accuse anybody of you know, fraud or intentional misrepresentation, but I think we have our pre-existing ideas of the way things should be. And by our, the gestalt of how we look at things, we, we find what we're looking for. And that's just how our cognition works. And so if you, if you set yourself up with your favorite theory and, you know, and an alternative theory, you, you give, it might give you a more balanced view of, of your data and what's available in your data. Um, and, um, but certainly, this little exercise in the yearling vervets would need to be looked at more. But I, I, I found it very interesting thinking about really just even what do we expect and, and what does happen. And very interesting that these um, young monkeys who had what could definitely be considered a more adverse early experience um, not only got over it, but actually did very well, did very well in the, um, and continued to take a more active part in their own development. And then the possibility that the marginal group was, did have its limit. And when they were in a more stressful situation, that, that then their deficit showed up. So um, I'm actually a little fast here. I thought I had too much to talk about. Uh, so my overall conclusions is maternal investment is sensitive to maternal condition. I think that everybody here would agree with that. <laughs> Infants are not passive recipients of maternal care decisions, which is something that I think everyone in this group would appreciate, but is not necessarily appreciated enough within certain areas of development. Um, Infants have adapted to respond to variation in maternal behavior within the expectable range of experience. And knowing what, what your paradigm is, knowing if you're interested in effects of early experience, understanding that you're going to get something if it's within a tolerable range that you're not going to get if it's a completely novel and different kind of stressor that this sort of organism has never experienced. Um, so kind of understanding if you're dealing with a range where there could be positive adaptations. Um, this study provided evidence for whatever theory is your favorite theory. Canalization, resilience, stress inoculation, and developmental programming after adverse early experience. If you just pick the, pick the behavior to demonstrate your theory. And it underscores the need to Consider nonlinear relationships. If you just throw these data into most of the models that we use for statistics, you're going to miss this because the, most of the statistics we use are looking for linear relationships. And unless you really intentionally are looking or uh, alerted to nonlinear relationships, and particularly if you pre-hypothesize them, because you don't want to let one outlier value that happens to be in the middle of your sample, um, you know, convince you too much that you've got a U-shaped or an inverted U-shaped function. But you really think about what your predictions are ahead of time, and if it's reasonable to consider that you're not talking about a linear relationship, and choose your statistics accordingly. And then also the type and degree of adverse experience, and also the target behavior, um, how, how that should relate um, uh, to the, um, how the outcome behavior should relate to the original experience in research and development. Okay, thank you.